please welcome the Atlantic's Chief Growth, Growth Officer, Mega Garibaldi. <laughs> Mika Garibaldi, Chief Growth Officer for The Atlantic, and we are so thrilled for you to join us today for this intriguing conversation produced by our underwriter, Genentech. Um, they define how large data sets, iterative data generation capabilities, and new algorithms are being used to train and optimize predictive and generative AI models that can yield new insights for drug discovery. Before we get started, I want to thank our underwriters, Jen and Tech, for this discussion. And now, please welcome Richard Bonu, Vice President of Prussian Design at Genentech, King Yun Cho, Senior Director of Frontier Research of Prussian Design at Genentech, Kimberly Powell, Vice President of Healthcare at NVIDIA, and finally, Alan Zong, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University. Thank you. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us and thanks to the organizers for what's been an amazing festival so far for me anyways. Um, today we're gonna talk about some deeply technical topics, but we're gonna just, it'll be easy. No, don't worry at all. But I, we'll start off with a little bit of an ideas introduction. And so uh, we'll start with Ellen, we'll go this way. Um, can you talk to us a little bit, just before we dive into some of the more structured questions about what you're excited about right now sure. in AI meets healthcare? Sure. Great. So um, I'm a assistant professor of computer science at Princeton, and our group is focused on machine learning for structural biology, uh, which really means like how do we use computational algorithms to understand the shapes of proteins and biological molecules. And I think the area of like kind of how do we understand the specific positioning of these atoms and why that's important is very exciting right now because of new kind of advances both on the computational side and on the experimental side at making sense of this. And hopefully, my kind of hypothesis is that'll be relevant for drug discovery. I'm looking forward it's to a good hypothesis. the conversation yeah. today. Yep. Yeah, well, thank you, Rich and The Atlantic. Um, at the end of the day, we're all patients here. And so I'm super excited to talk about what AI is going to do uh, in drug discovery. It, just a couple fundamental things to recognize about AI is you need three things. You need data, you need models, and you need computers. So I run uh, the healthcare group at NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a company that is most known for computer graphics and gaming, um, but we invented something called the GPU. And this GPU now today, over the last couple of years, has really been the foundational computer that underlies today's artificial intelligence. Uh, chat GPT would not have been possible without uh, the GPU. So what is super exciting today is, you know, one, if you think about the data, we are living in the digital biology data revolution, just like we were 10 years ago in the internet and, and pictures and videos revolution of our phones. We have that same phenomenon going on in digital biology. So we've got the data. ChatGPT is here. It's the iPhone moment for AI. And that same technology can be completely applied across the biology domain. So we have the data, we have the methods and the model, and then NVIDIA has been over the last 10 years really preparing for this moment, building computers that would fill this entire wharf, um, running all of the AI that we kind of consume every day, face recognition, automatic speech recognition. And so we've been building the infrastructure that today we can apply that into drug discovery. So that's what I'm super excited about. And it's hard to overestimate how important NVIDIA has been to that, that transition. I, I want to throw you a curveball, though. OK. Right. Instead, instead of telling us, I, I have to mess with the guy a little bit. So <laughs> we know that healthcare and a lot of things in, in life are being changed by machine learning. But I want to know a little bit your views on how machine learning is giving problems to the machine learning community. That, that motivate better science or better math or better basic science? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, the, so we often think about the AI as something that is you know, the magical and elusive that's going to change the world by solving all these problems that are already here. But you know, of course, it's not just a one-way street. It's a you know, uh, two-way street in the sense that the AI or, and or computer science is a field where we try to solve problems. So we're just a group of the problem solvers. And then 
what that means is that yeah, how we progress, how, how we make progress ourselves is by being inspired by the problems out there. And then healthcare, and in particular the drug discovery, is in fact one of the most challenging problems that we really need to solve as a whole humanity. And then you know, the, during the past, let's say, one century, we've made a tremendous progress, but it's only just a one century out of the entire history of the humanity. So what that means is that the, we really do look at drug discovery and then find a lot of challenges that we never even imagined that the AI could even solve before. So instead of just building a, let's say, object recognition systems, we now want to actually build a systems that are able to see something that humans could not even see. And then that's what Alan has been actually working on for many years. Mm -hmm. And then you know, the, when we look at, uh, instead of looking at, let's say, language models that are going to produce the language that we can understand and we can say ourselves, now we want to actually produce all these, let's say, language of the biology, that is, let's say, proteins or the molecules or whatnot. So what that means is that the, you know, the AI has started to look at different, let's say, directions of the progress that we need to take thanks to the motivations and inspirations from the healthcare and drug discovery. And then some of the keywords that I can throw here is the active learning, online learning, as well as the black box optimization, and then more robust, so the causal machine learning. And we, we broke our promise, so just, that's a little jargon, but active learning, <laughs> yes. as Professor Cho mentioned here, is when you actually use the results from an experiment to, to drive the next model, the model to drive the next experiment, and you try to learn faster than by if you, you randomly sample. But that, that's a great thing uh, to mention. So when we're thinking about 100 years of computer science, if you go all the way back to Leibniz, maybe you get 120. But um, if you think about a short span of computer science interacting with this history of humanity span of natural science, for example, how, you know, how do we build teams that, that can sort of take advantage of that ancient tradition, oral tradition, now we write things down, and, um, and what we can do with machine learning? How do we actually put together engineers with, with scientists in a meaningful way? I mean, that seems like a big challenge to me. It, Kim, maybe you could you could Yeah, this is, a, this is a super important uh, it, topic, I think. It's something that all of us need to think about, whether you're sitting in a technology company or you're a clinician practicing, practicing radiology, for example. Um, it was said by some very smart people in 2016 that AI was going to fully replace radiologists. Um, and radiologists had quite a fear of it. Um, when you go today to a radiology conference, it's AI integrated everywhere. And so what really had to happen was, um, I think as Ken Young was saying, it's really starting with the use case. What problem are you trying to solve? And everybody you know, sort of, again, thought it was this magical moment. It's going to diagnose everybody better than a human. Well, really, um, there's so much application of AI upstream and downstream of the actual diagnosis itself. Um, it can help just do, hey, could you sort all of the um, patients that have already shown, you've shown me are normal, and let me just focus on the really hard patients. Or it can do downstream things, like now that we've seen that they have this um, anomaly in their image, what is the next thing we should do? Um, very similarly, um, this is the case in drug discovery. Um, you, have, uh, you have incredible multidisciplinary uh, teams that have to come together. Drug discovery is, you know, how do you understand? You have to crack the biology. You then have to look into an essentially infinite space of either proteins or chemicals that can be introduced to change that biology's behavior. And then you have to make sure it's makeable and safe to put in a human. Um, this is a challenge that has been with us forever, right? It takes 12 years and $2 billion to develop a drug. And so what we're all trying to do here commonly is how can we apply artificial intelligence to some of these very critical things in a way that helps us reduce that time? And as, as Rich was saying, um, experimentation is still very, very important, but how can we use every experiment we do feed it back into our models so they get better, and then maybe even we're predicting a whole bunch more using AI up front to not look at maybe a thousand potential things that a human has the capacity to do, but can we go through billions of potential possibilities? I mean, there's more chemicals, uh, potentials, than there are particles in the atmosphere. 
right? Just, just think about that. So an AI can really kind of look at that and bring you much closer to the possibility, then it goes into experimentation. And so this integration um, is really, really important. And so if you're gonna be working with experimentalists, they are the domain experts. You have to move the computational tools right there with them so they can see the results of these models, start trusting these models, and then, as you say, kind of building that into a new integrated process. That's great. Yeah, and the radiology example is perfect. That's, that's uh, Dr. Cho has had a little bit of, of experience with that, and, and I, we've definitely had cases where just rotating the image, different resolutions, simple things that a human wouldn't think twice about would be impossible you know, for the code. And so from application to, to scale, that, that's really a, a perfect example. Yeah. When, when you say model, I, I go back to, to my roots a little bit, and I think about structure. Um, so I might ask a little bit, how do we, when we think about machine learning, we have the machinery that makes a prediction or it generates something, but often in in the life sciences and in healthcare, when we think of a model, we think of something that we can actually give to another person. Often a model is this gene interacts with that gene. It's a pathway. It's a picture of a cell. It's a description that the reason this happens is because this thing moves from this part of the cell to that. So a model can be a very simple thing. A model can also be a two billion parameter you know, machine learning model properly. Ellen, where do you think the right place yeah. uh, to, to sort of fall on that spectrum when we when we share things yeah, uh, I mean, should be for these, these models. I think this goes back to what Kimberly was saying with right now AIs can be very powerful at distilling the data, kind of helping make predictions when we have like so much complexity in biology and biological data domains. Um, and so I think the interpretability part is really important, but on the team's aspect, I think we need people that understand both the machine learning models and the biological data um, so that you can understand like, okay, maybe we just needed it to rescale and better augment the uh, radiology examples for training, and that's just a weird artifact of training the models, or the model's actually picking up on something useful. So I think it really depends on the specific application area, but you, in an ideal world, want people who understand both the machine learning side of things and the biology side of things. And that's one thing I want to kind of go for on, in terms of like, on the academic side and training kind of the uh -huh. next generation. Uh -huh. yeah. And you know, we look at the notes, look up Ellen, and there's some pictures in those papers that are pretty far out. Um, <laughs> she uses machine learning to actually pull structures of very complex molecular machineries out of living cells. That I think mm -hmm. is a preprint. I don't know if it got accepted mm -hmm. yet, but it, uh, there's some nice pictures there. And so it's possible that if Ellen says this is the interpretation, it might still be fairly complex. Right. But OK, fine. For other scientists, for other <laughs> practitioners. Um, you know, with all these tools, uh, you know, again, I'm going to come back to the team question. Um, we could talk about how machine learning models perform and how to make them perform better. And this is a narrative that we see a lot, right? But let's imagine they perform good enough or we have a version of the model. How do we put that into? Something like Genentech, where, where you are, uh, Kyung Young, or, or NVIDIA yes. working with a partner. H how do we actually deploy these things when we're trying to design something that then has to go through this very intense regulatory process or has to be put into patients? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so traditionally, so if you think about the machine learning based, let's say, AI systems, the traditional way in which we've been using them is to solve the problems that we know how to solve ourselves, to speed up how we solve the problems. So for instance, we talked about the radiologist. Often what people's mind goes to immediately is that, okay, can we build a system that's going to replace, that is able to replace radiologists, rather than to solve a problem that radiologists cannot solve, so as to augment you know, the existing expertise of the humans to go beyond what we were able to do so. Now, because of that, in the traditional sense, what people would have done is that they build a system, they collect some of the test cases, test them out, and then see if this system works well, and then say that, well, here's a good system, let's deploy it. In fact, you know, ChatGPT is not that different. We mentioned the ChatGPT over and over. ChatGPT is amazing, but it solves the problems that we individuals can actually solve the problem pretty well already. Now, if you want to go one step further, and then trying to use this AI system to solve problems that we don't know how to solve, for instance, screening through the billions of the molecules, as Kim pointed out earlier, we cannot do that ourselves. Or you know, they're trying to look at the, I don't know, electron microscopy, let's say, raw signal, and then trying to get the sense of the structure of the uh, proteins. 
we cannot do that ourselves. You know, the schools just look like a random numbers to us. But you know, the Ellen has been able to actually using AI to squeeze out this important let's say, signal behind it. So then you know, the Genentech, what we do, what, what that means is that we need to go beyond just collecting the test examples from the people because these are now problems that we don't know how to solve ourselves, but we want to actually now connect it with the experimentation or the ways in which that goes beyond just a simple, let's say, human eyes-based validation. And then this is in Genentech, in particular in Genentech, all the research and uh, discovery, what we call as a lap-in-the-loop paradigm. So it's not just going to be a, here's a machine, AI system that we have built, for instance, a pressure and design, and then we're going to just test this AI system on a fixed set of the data that has been collected in the past. But now we're going to use this AI system also to guide us, guide our lab experimentation to produce the data that are going to be even more useful down the road. And then this newly created data comes back into this AI system so that the AI system gets better. So what that means is that in this lab in the loop kind of a setup, we are not just talking about a building a static system, but building this loop that allows us to iteratively improve the AI system as well as our knowledge of the world as well. And then thereby, along the way, we're going to end up with, uh, let's say, better therapeutics, hopefully. That's what we are all here for. Or you have to try to solve the problems that we didn't even know that we had to actually solve. Yeah, that's great. And it is important to point out that sometimes the difference between applying machine learning to different problems is the cost of seeing if you got the answer right. Um, you know, it's not easy to see, did this drug work? And we're not going to take anything that we don't think is safe and try it with people. Um, or even animals. Um, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stages and a lot of structure to that, that that's very important. So that, that is really great. And so what you're saying, though, is don't measure twice and cut once. Me just cut and measure. Just go, just go crazy. Um, yep, it yep. sounds like there's some details but you're, you're sheltering us from there. Um, scientifically crazy. Let's Science. put it like that, yes. Yeah, no, we're, we're very, yeah, uh, yeah. But it, this is like such an important uh, thing to consider, right? One is the science behind building and training a model that can do something that maybe humans couldn't do before, right? So we kind of think of that as an AI factory, right? Generate something. And then you need to go deploy it, um, whether through an experiment um, generally validated through an experiment, and that is what is going to allow a scientist who hasn't really understand the fundamentals of what this AI and how it was trained and how that all works to start understanding and believing in its yeah. predictions. And so that lab in the loop is the, I think, transcendence of a computer scientist becoming a biologist and a biologist to become a computer scientist. And it creates this just beautiful flywheel which if you ha are like me and you, you, you see this field of AI moving at a pace that I've never seen technology move before, um, doing it in such a deep scientific domain, that's what's going to allow us to move at that pace uh, yeah. just as well in this domain, which is super complex. And I guess, Ellen, even when you're going after some amazing cell process, I guess mm -hmm. even there there must be some iteration looking at the prior structures and forming yeah, the models. Yeah, I definitely think there's iteration, but the lab in the loop, I'm curious to hear more about the details because mm. I think that works well for some types of problems where you have like a well-defined kind of task that you want, like mm. drug discovery. And maybe like drug discovery and other bioengineering things, it makes sense to set up this like kind of feedback system yep. between AI and experiments. But on the more like fundamental biology side, that's like very kind of, you need to like get really deep in your data, you need to analyze it, interpret it both with the assistance of these AI tools, yeah. but then also with like, you know, still with our, with uh, our brains. Yeah, with our absolutely, brains. absolutely. So the lab in the loop system that I just mentioned was a kind of, let's say, high level concept, right? So when we implement that in reality, for instance, at Genentech, we have to really carefully uh, design it for a particular problem we are solving. So if you want to design some, let's say, new therapeutics or define the molecules, then we're going to have a set of, let's say, properties that we want to ensure that these molecules actually satisfy because otherwise, you know, as Rich pointed out, we're not going to inject them to any patients, right? So what that means is that the, we need to define what the goal is for every problem that we are trying to solve. And in, when, coming back to the basic science, and I think, the, in fact, basic science is where we have the clearest possible goal. Mm -hmm. That is our curiosity. Now, can we actually satisfy our curiosity as much as possible? And then given a limited resources, and then you at the lab as well as a compute, 
-hmm. Now, can we try to find the design or the design an experiment that's going to maximally satisfy our curiosity? Mm -hmm. So I'll say it's actually it fits even better for basic science. Oh, mm -hmm. oh touche. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, when we think about what do we need for it to be a safe thing to do, mm -hmm. right? For you, it might mean, I know that if I solve this structure, it goes in the PDB. People will follow up on it. For, you know, in a business setting, you might have to say, I need to solve these, this problem, but I also need to guarantee some boundaries that are contractual. You know, drug discovery, we, we have a lot of safety and, and efficacy issues. So it's, it's interesting to hear about the different takes here. And I think all three of you are agreeing, but with uh, really different uh, parts of the scale that we look at things. Um, so if we put the, the, the lab in the loop, and I think our experimental colleagues would say not lab in the loop, they'd say computer nerds in the loop or something like that. They might say it like slightly different, like the lab is the thing, you guys are in the loop, not us, but um, that's fine. We, we can sort of figure that out later. But um, as we're sort of doing this, we're actually talking about a big part of the design process for a lot of different things, a big part of the data acquisition process for a lot of key public efforts even. Um, how do we think about maybe not safety, but some other values that we want to put onto those systems. And we could think about inclusion um, and equitable machine learning. How do we make sure that, that no one gets left behind if we're handing over the keys to some of these decisions to automated processes? Yeah, I mean, from a computational pl computing company perspective, one of our, um, I think, grounding philosophies is um, we need to, in order to get to equity and inclusion, things have to be accessible. Mm -hmm. So this, this idea, big idea of an AI model or training models or running models, um, we need to put that in the hands of everybody. Um, so, you know, running the healthcare group at NVIDIA, what we, our charter is really, how do we make this accessible to a biologist or a bioinformaticist or some uh, computational chemist? Um, how do we allow them to experiment with this technology and or just hands-on touch it, sort of like what I was describing before. And so we build you know, actual software platforms on top of these computers that as Kyung Young was saying, sorry, I'm, I know I'm trying, uh, no, um, is we can speak the language of biology. We can speak the language of chemistry. So we've made all this foundational breakthrough in understanding the structure of language. You know, words make a sentence, which make a paragraph, which can write a book. Um, we're trying to do a ton of that in the area of biology, but it requires tooling. You know, it just doesn't, out of the box, go to GitHub and you, you can do some of this stuff. So it's really about, um, you know, publishing uh, not only the papers, but making those papers reproducible so we try to reproduce all of the state of the art that's going on there and into workflows that you can access and get to on computers. And we build computers that are the size of a credit card all the way through their inside of every public cloud. So the accessibility factor is huge. Not only just accessibility to the computers themselves, but the accessibility to speak the language of a given domain. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the language of you know drug discovery, which includes genomics and proteins and chemistry and real world evidence and all of those great things in healthcare. That sounds great. Yeah, and it, I, every once in a while I think I do and I think some of my peers I see falling into this techno chauvinism that making it better will make it safer or will make it more inclusive. Um, I definitely know that that accessibility with more powerful tools puts you in a much better place to, to take a shot for something that could be more inclusive. And that's definitely a big goal, uh, I think, for the industry. Um, I, I was thinking that we could maybe try to disagree a little bit right before we... <laughs> and <laughs> we're going to have mic runners. We're going to have questions pretty soon. So start thinking them up, because I'm almost out of note cards. So we've got <laughs> to get going there. Um, but are there things that we disagree about? Are there things that are controversies in machine learning? Uh, you know, whether whether it's applied in a core science or in, or in a business or, or pharma setting? What, what are the things that we might disagree about? I have a question for oh. Kyung Hyung. Oh, for oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is, please. You were talking about, I mean, it was part of your question earlier on what kind of advances from, uh, from like the sciences have inspired machine learning advances. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, uh, do you think 
ChatGPT and LLMs are maybe more interesting and more mysterious, or do you think like the language of biology is more interesting and mysterious? Hmm. Oh, that's a. Um, then we can disagree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I heard earlier that the, the uh, someone from OpenAI, who I'm not going to name, actually <laughs> gave a talk here at yeah. the Atlantic Festival. So to be very frank, as I have been so far, yeah. yes. Um, so. ChatGPT or a lot of the technologies that are behind ChatGPT are literally 50 years old. So from an AI technology or the machine learning science perspective, some of them are interesting. There are some, let's say, unresolved issues. But generally, it is the, the way in which they actually put everything together and then figured out a pipeline to collect the high quality data in a way that is much more rapid than before that is really, really uh, impressive, but not the technology itself. So, and then you have to, what that means is that the, I do find what we do here in drug discovery or in a basic, uh, AI for basic science, because that's actually where, we're actually, where we have to come up with a new technology in order to solve or extract the insights from the nature that we just could not even imagine we're doing until you know very recently, and then you know, we're going to make a progress. So yeah, ChatGPT. I don't know. To me, meh. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're talking. I've never heard of this thing. Large large language models unbranded. We could. I mean, I thought yeah. you wanted some controversy. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know. What what keeps you up at night, Kim? You know, I, I think um, for me, it's helping the world um, get comfortable with AI because what what is so profound is that you know it, in going back to radiology as you said um, it, it happened back in the early days where a radiologist sat in front of an AI prediction and he was never trained to, to look for that particular mm -hmm. feature in the image and it really was an early indicator of brain tumor it's just not what they were you know trained to do um, so that moves the field forward. Um, we're doing amazing things in the area of genomics. We, we, you know, we worked with the national labs to develop a large language model um, for genomics that can predict the next variant of the SARS-CoV-2 before it happens uh, to potentially put that capability in the hands of vaccine makers, which now, uh, with Moderna, was able to go from idea to, you know, in three weeks, something that used to be a two-year process, Maybe. for example. So p part of me is um, f fear less, experiment more, and you, you, of course, with all the checks and balances, but um, all the deep scientists, clinicians who've dedicated their life to understanding a domain so deep and caring for patients and trying to find medicines to cure diseases, I don't want their either fear or, and or way that they were taught to prevent them from thinking that this absolutely is the most powerful technology of our lifetime. So I'm happy to disagree with anyone on that topic, <laughs> or I'm happy to allow you to agree with it. And, and so th that to me is just what I you know, wake up every day is, how do we continue to um, instill confidence and provide tools and accessibility? Um, and, and that's why opportunities like this is just a great time to have the conversation and continue the conversation. Yeah. Um, can we get a mic to the back here? <laughs> and, uh, we're, we're recording for a whole bunch of people, so if you don't mind, uh, thanks. I think especially in d drug discovery, I don't understand how you deal with the conflict of international uh, intellectual uh, property and access to data. I mean, you know, it seems to me this is going to be a legal morass uh, because it's a problem. It's not how the industry has historically run. It's not how it's produced its profitability. That's a great question. Yeah, I, mean, um, I can try to answer that. So, of course, the types of the data that we use for drug discovery is not just uh, one homogeneous data, but very heterogeneous. So we have all those, let's say, molecular data that we get, and then we also use all those data from the lab experiments that we run. And then, of course, you know, there are further, let's say, experimentation that are done at the clinics and so on. So depending on what kind of data we're talking about, of course, there is a, you know, some of them are highly sensitive, such as the one that includes any kind of patient identifying information. We have to be extremely, extremely careful about it. 
if the data is more like on the molecular side, then it's slightly less sensitive from the perspective of the privacy, but from the different perspectives. So then you the, we do actually have a very strict, let's say, framework within the company, for instance, to ensure that the, we only can have access to the relevant data for our job. Now, you're actually, this question is really great because that's how it's done, how it has been done so far. But as we go forward in time with this kind of new technology in the horizon, and some of which are already here, we will have to adapt ourselves, not only within a company, but across the, uh, you know, across the you know, com com company boundaries, as well as the country boundaries and everything. And then there are a lot of, let's say, discussions that are happening, not only at the pharmaceuticals, but also at the hospitals, also at the insurance companies and whatnot, in order to figure out what is the right way to do it. Yeah. And then you, the, you probably will hear some of the, you know, the relevant things. I mean, the, even the OpenAI talk, I think they, they mentioned a bit about the privacy there as well. So, so things are happening. It's actually way more kind of a, say, uh, complicated and diverse as a topic than you know, the, we, can, we see from well, the outside. If you've ever had kids, you know, at some point you're just making your 150th school lunch and you're like, what is going on? Talking about data access is a big part of being at a big drug company, for example. And uh, you got to do it all the time. It's like making school lunches. You can't, you can't forget it. But I, I think that one thing that I've found is that at Genentech and Roche, all that infrastructure was in place a, a lot more than at, say, a small startup uh, that's doing something more commodity or more related to advertisement or, or whatever. So I do, I do think we can do it. I do think we have the tools to so. do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But I wouldn't, sorry, wouldn't you also say that um, just the, the way that AI has developed um, as a technology has been in the open source, a very large part of it. Um, and groups like yourself in the commercial space as well as in the academic space and even in these new startups, they are all publishing their work, which is really phenomenal because then the next person can build on top of it. And so um, it is a fact, uh, if you look at the data, that AI and machine learning have created more what they call investigational new drugs, um, 10 times more in the last two years um, than they did before, and now making up 10% of all of these new drug applications to the FDA. What that says to me is it's not any one company that's doing it. It's actually a very large enabled community of academic researchers, of startup companies, and pharma. And, you know, you, Genentech is one of the most innovative um, large pharma companies out there on the planet, but a lot of them rely on academic research to really move their drugs forward. And, and it is a fact that we just... Don't have, we have many more diseases than we have drugs for, so we want more than less people uh, working on it. I think we do. We need mics at multiple places here. So. <laughs> uh, and we're, we're in Q&A, and we got plenty of time, so we'll get to everyone. Thanks so much to the panelists. This is a great discussion. Um, Kim, perhaps you just touched on this, but my question is on health equity. Um, you know, Working in the space, being a woman of color, there are lots of conditions that we continue to be told, we don't know why this happens to you. We don't know why you have a higher mortality rate or otherwise, <clears throat> it, the list goes on. Could you speak to how AI is or can address some of those disparities to first of all learn why to then help us make better medicines? Thank yeah. You. Yeah, it's something I think about every day as well. Um, one of the things we can do is, as I say, access, commoditize access to core technology or data generation that would allow us to learn more about uh, different race and ethnicity at the ground, from the ground up. One of those is genomic sequencing. Uh, we work with companies who are now achieving a $100 genome. When we can achieve something like a $100 genome or a $50 genome, we're going to be able to sequence a much broader population and maybe even bring it into the standard of care so that that data mix is much more representative of the population. So that's, that's one is to commoditize it. And then I think secondarily is commoditize it through um, the, patient, the patient journey and making it as cheap and accessible as possible. I mean, those are just two ways that we know how to help 
um, in some way, but then it's this education and, as I say, putting these tools into this, the, the, the startups that are, um, you know, building in Africa, the start, all over the world there are startups that are working in this area, and it's where they're finally able to because the barrier to, to entry and working in this area, it continues yeah. to drop. And, you know, I just want to shout out to Meredith Broussard, who wrote a book called More Than a Glitch, but she was um, very kind and talked at Genentech last week, and one of the things she pointed out was that sometimes you also have to say no. Like, I don't want to use machine learning. Um, she was talking about policing and some other issues where maybe no is a really the right. Um, and the other thing I think she pointed out is that the health care community, clinicians are, are getting to a place where they could meet us in the middle. And she, an example she used was just getting rid of the multiplier on deciding whether or not uh, you need uh, dialysis. And so there was, a, are you a black man? And if so, we put in this, this number. And then you're less likely to get the care you need. And that, that multiplier was removed uh, in 2021, 2022. So she had some examples of, even if the classifier is just a linear regression, just four numbers with four weights, you know, there, there's still a lot of work to do, even in the, the machine learning of the 50s that's still with us today. And so I, I, it's a fantastic question. I, I think we really need to, to work hard there. We've got, if it's all right, we've got another question over there, and then we'll get back to Lewis. Thank you all for coming. This is a, a basic lab question. I want you all to solve my problems, please. And, <laughs> and that is, do you see any possibility for AI to be pointed at the vast amount of database data that's out there to clean it up, right? I mean, mm. P53 cannot possibly be involved in every damn thing. That <laughs> um, I, right, I mean, we're, yeah. we're human, so we have this sort of uh, uh, fashionableness of a particular pathway or a particular thing. And it seems to me that pointing AI at this could, could clean that up pretty darn nicely. But that would need to be an open source public thing. Stopping observation bias, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think, right, definitely the observation bias can severely kind of impact what these models end up being really good at. Um, so that's something for sure to take into account. And I think this goes back to the data problem of we have to think about what data these models are trained on. I think it's kind of an open research question if there's enough good, diverse data for biological kind of foundation models. Um, and like, are we at that point yet? Do we know enough about the underlying biology to be able to use AI effectively right now? I mean, I think we're all here, so like we're trying we're for trying. that to be the case, but I think that's an open research question for sure. And we need mics here, there. I would love for our panelists to maybe make a prediction mm -hmm. and um, maybe there's a lot of conversation around. Right, we're out of time, sir. The <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of conversation now about the impact of AI on society. And I think the opportunity in drug discovery is perhaps one of the brightest opportunities that machine learning has to make an impact there. And so I'd, I'd love for our panelists maybe to take us out 50 years from now. What does the application of drug discovery in biology mean for accessibility, for cost? If you guys could maybe paint a picture for what it looks like 50 years from now. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can quickly start. I guess we all need to give the prediction. One, maybe not in 50 years, but you know, in 10 years, what I actually really hope to see is not particularly about the drug discovery, but in the general healthcare. Healthcare is inherently a resource, you know, the limited, let's say, problem that we need to solve as a society. And then you know, the better prediction of you know, the what's going to happen to patients, what's going to happen to the system, what's going to happen to the entire, let's say, stockpile of the different, let's say, resources will actually allow us to allocate these limited resources we have to as many patients or the people in the society as possible with the, while maximally, uh, maximizing the equity. We do see that you know, the better prediction is absolutely possible using this latest, let's say, advances in AI that looks at all those information within the hospital. And then eventually, in my opinion, and my hope is that in five years, we're going to do see the much, much more equitable healthcare that is implemented across the society because of the AI's better prediction that allows us to do a better resource allocation. That's an I optimistic think, take, all right. I think in 50 years, maybe we'll understand the brain finally. No. I think right mm. now we have no idea how the brain works. And I think people are beginning to try to understand how AIs work at this like emergent level of scale. 
Um, but I think what you were saying is AI is having a really big impact on drug discovery. I actually think it's not yet having a huge impact on drug discovery. The place where AI has really recently had a big impact is on the basic biology and the fundamental understanding. And I think through that and through you know, many more years or even decades of research into following up on those predictions and following up on how things are working, we'll be able to maybe make the biological breakthroughs that help us understand you know, life or our brains or many other things. That's exciting, yeah. Yeah. Well, you said 50 years. I mean, I, I, I'm also on a 10-year horizon. I mean, the, the, this whole term personalized medicine drives me out of my mind. <laughs> uh, but absolutely, uh, AI is going to help in this. We work with a ton of companies who, uh, maybe to answer the question around, can AI help us take all this unstructured, crazy data that has been collected about us as patients over the last two decades and put into electronic health records, and um, make that more accessible to drug discovery because outcomes are important, but to the healthcare delivery process. Um, connecting that with genomics becoming a standard of care um, and also the ability to deploy different type of monitoring and instrumentation. You know, we want to get to preventative medicine, A. Can we predict that you this might happen to you and therefore administer these type of tests, liquid biopsy, the next generation of real theranos is mm -hmm. on the horizon here. And we are going to be measuring way different aspects of our biology, which all needs to get fed into these systems. And in, you know, I, you know, that's probably like, a, I'm probably on the 25 year horizon when my true personalized medicine will maybe be within the, 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 the realm of reach. We're, we're able to create medicines much faster if we know what we're actually trying to do. We don't know that in a lot of cases, which is why unlocking the biology is really important. Yeah. Um, but then I think looking across the entire healthcare data repertoire and using AI to, you know, structure that data and, and bring it all together in ways that it will be more personalized towards me, prevent me from getting sick, and or create me a medicine that is for me and not for the general population in this room when we have a headache. I, I, you know, 50 years, whatever these models look like, it'll be a fantastic library just to contemplate. Right? It'll have the stuff of life. It'll be able to give us those decisions, but it'll be a technology. So will society be in a position where that technology is used properly or not, that's, you could ask the same thing in many technologies. But I do think that with that long of a horizon, the blockers that are going to block us that far from now are things we can't even imagine. But, but I think there is a lot of potential here. Now, before we get to one last question, the scorecard so far is minus 10 for three mentions of chatbots. You just got a minus three, but you made it up, so you're up to a few <laughs> points above zero. Ellen is currently winning. Okay. Oh. Because you, you mentioned Theranos, but that's okay. Yeah. You, you, can, you, got, you got 11 seconds to come from behind. Um, we'll do one more question. I think we are out of time. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the alignment problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we, with the rise of you know, autonomous AI agents, I think we've seen enough examples where the AI system can sort of iterate through a bunch of decisions and actually reach many goals and objectives that are sort of human-like. Mm -hmm. And so kind of that raised the imperative of having a, you know, a human involved, mm -hmm. you know, having some sort of decision-making power through this process. I do wonder mm -hmm. what the alignment problem looks like in drug discovery, how you imagine you know, our own biases as humans, which you know, takes many colors and flavors, how that is sort of built in subconsciously into some of these things, you know, thinking about the risks. And then, yeah, what that looks like for drug discovery, kind of generally. Amity, I can add something there. Um, so, as so, in fact, the, a lot of time when people, in particular in Silicon Valley, talk about the alignment problem or the AI alignment, they often assume a very small number of, if not just a one particular uh, value, that yeah. they want their AI system to be aligned to. But unfortunately, that is a very elusive concept. And often when you read some of these papers coming out, this time I'm not going to mention any company's names. So yeah, you're, you're and already. what you see is that the, they try to find a proxy by running some kind of survey or the data annotation, often with the annotators coming from the same group of the people or from the same area. So what, 
but then you know, the, what I believe we are doing with the drug discovery is not trying to actually treat or you know, the, you know, address the condition that is just elusive and then that doesn't exist. But we are actually trying to make sure that the, we are able to have an AI technology that allows us to come up with the therapeutics for every individual condition possible. And it connects to what Kim said is that the, the ultimate eventual goal of any kind of drug discovery or any kind of healthcare is the extreme personalization because everyone is different from each other. Every condition is conditioned on who is having the condition. So what we want is not to have this one elusive, let's say, concept of the value or the condition that we design drugs for, but we really want to push the boundary so that the, we can design drugs rapidly for every condition, for everyone on the fly. Yeah, that, that's a great way to wrap things up. Um, we have a booth uh, for Genentech. A few of us will be milling around there to answer a few more questions. But we do have another panel coming in, so I think we've got to say thank you thank to you. the panelists. Thank you.